to the SAP Art of Business Studio. We're here at the Heimat Museum in Davos and it's actually during the World Economic Forum annual meeting. My name is Tanya hofer -Erisman. I am the Global Lead for Research and Incubation at the SAP Intelligent Enterprise Institute and I'm here with uh, my distinguished panellist speakers that I really look forward uh, to talk to today. Um, so we have on the left here Kai Muller who is founder and CEO of Experience One. Uh, he's a computer scientist, future maker, entrepreneur, founder. Um, also, he started his career uh, at Mercedes-Benz and he's, you know, in many folk, uh, conferences as a speaker on the topic of Gen AI. And one little thing he told me when we had a conversation before is he really likes humour, so it's his secret weapon. Then we have Abbas Ricky here, who is the Chief uh, Strategy Officer of Cloudera former Forbes and CNBC council member, speaker at World Economic Forum and other data focused conferences. And his hobby is actually mixing music. I called him a DJ before, but he says he doesn't do it as professionally. He is mixing music. And we have Nico Moore, who is senior expert partner at McKinsey. He's valued for his deep expertise in digital and technology strategy and transformation topics, as well as he is a leading global expert on quantum and IoT. He's also a professor at University of Regensburg, and he is a president of the Carnival Society in Trier. So I welcome you all to this panel discussion, and I really look forward to talk to you about our interesting topic today. So today we're going to talk about future-proof decisions, the opportunity for better strategies. And I think, I mean, we've all been walking around Davos, and when we talk about future and we talk about strategies, you cannot get around the topic of AI this year, right? So this seems to be one of the key uh, topics. So what we want to really explore a bit is the impact that AI has on businesses, particularly on how decisions are made, how they're run on their processes, and maybe see what insights we get there. So Nico, I think I'll start with you. So where do you see the biggest impact of AI on businesses? Yeah, so first of all, I think um, it's not a question where do we have impact of AI in, in businesses, especially in business processes. Uh, it's a question how we use AI in those processes, because it is basically impacting everything. Yeah. Yeah? And uh, we, from, from our McKinsey perspective, we are also looking into this and trying also to understand what is the economic potential and the economic value um, contributed yeah. by using AI. And um, we did an analysis and the research and we found out that uh, companies using AI intensively um, based on their financial performance, they have a 2.5 times higher financial performance compared to the, the other companies not using AI uh -huh. uh, to that extent. Yeah? And it's based on uh, total return on shareholder, mm -hmm. yeah. So five years CAGR, and uh, so it's um, a pretty fundamental distance, yeah. um, strategic distance. Companies build when they are using AI, right. and uh, it's basically affecting any single process mm -hmm. in an organization. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we have a chance to talk about Gen AI later. Mm -hmm. So there is a bit a bit of a difference which processes are being affected more than others. Yeah. But uh, for now, I leave it like this. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And we will have the chance to talk about this a bit more. Anything you want to comment on, Kai? Um, uh, well, I think we've, uh, I'll, I'll pick up the generative AI yeah. uh, part because there's really something, uh, how I look at the thing, because AI has been around for 20, 30 years now and the new stuff with generative AI well, it gives us an indication of where this is going, especially as we're talking about decisions later. I think it's really interesting to see how we can now use a lot of data that has been there in the past, mm -hmm. look at it and get some insights, but also probably reasoning out of this to empower future decisions. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a technology. It's never been there in that way. And I think we've all been to 2023 like reading papers every week and learning and learning. Felt like a year in school, uh, not like any other. So um, yeah, pretty amazed about the potential um, uh, that we still have to tap into. Okay, perfect. We'll get back to that later on. What about you? Any views on where you see the biggest impact of AI on businesses? Yeah, I think um, so. the first observation that we've all had okay. is if you look at Davos, where arguably almost every sector, every industry is covered, everyone's talking about AI. Every company happens to be an AI company. 
And this has changed very quickly because last year at Davos, there were barely few people who were talking about AI and you almost think that did it suddenly happen. But the reality is that in the last 40 odd years, there hasn't been a technology that impacts every persona. So if you look at a business, any vertical, any industry, whether that's the CEO, CFO, analyst, practitioner, IT person, finance person, controller, all kinds of personas, they're all likely to be impacted in certain ways by AI. And that hasn't been, there hasn't been a technology like that in the last 40 years. So I'd say it's gonna be all pervasive. Mm -hmm. Right now, not a lot of people are aware of where the puck's gonna land insofar as generative AI is concerned, still early days. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of promising use cases which give us indication that whether that be companies, organizations or personas, that they will benefit extremely going forward. Yeah. Of course, then with that comes its own risk and few people will talk about that and as they should, yeah. because we should all be prepared about that. Um, but overall, I believe that there are likely to be profound positive impacts mm -hmm. across the society in general, but also in a corporation, it will impact almost every persona. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And I think you, you basically all picked on that topic. It's gonna impact all of the business, all of the roles, all of the processes uh, in just many different ways. And I think that leads us very well into kind of the next chapter of what we want to talk about, which is really about the decision making, the intersection of decision making and AI. And I think there, as you said, you know, you can think about it from, from two perspectives. You can think about it from a perspective of kind of the spectrum of automation, where you go from manual to augmented to automated and into autonomous at some point. But then you can also think about it on another axis, on, on what the type and level of decision or process is that's being impacted? Is that operational? Is that tactical? Or is that strategic? And if we're thinking, you know, in, in that framework from, from manual to autonomous and from tactical or operational to then strategic, there's basically everything's going to be impacted. It's just a question of where it starts and, and where it ends, I think. And then, you know, having, having said that, Abbas, maybe back to you, how do you think um, AI is enhancing business operations through better decision making? Yeah, so I think um, there are manifold ways in which we can look at the categories which AI is likely to impact or their impact today. Uh, but maybe let me take a few examples that might be easiest for everyone to talk about. And um, so there is a luxury car manufacturer in Germany. You guys are fairly all aware of that. Um, they, for example, they're building their entire future of electric vehicles on our technology, our being cloud or machine learning. But they're planning to use AI for everything, all the way from after sales to supply chain manufacturing, but also taking driver data inputs and providing that for the future in terms of how the behavior should manifest into the design mechanisms. They're also looking at ways in which the battery is supposed to be behaving going forward. Um, and that is a massive step for a company of that size to drive decisions, not just which are consequential for bottom line impacts, mm -hmm. but also the top line and the design and the future. There's another company we work with, Abu, for example, and they're working to look at the molecular footprint of a disease. Mm -hmm. And through advances in AI, that'll only get better. And that's another area which will unlock health benefits for millions of people, which mm -hmm. is a massive opportunity for not just for that company, but also for other companies out there as well. But if you look at the more traditional industries, right, like banking or financial services, insurance, yeah. these are industries which we all know of to be rather antiquated yeah. um, because of legacy infrastructure systems that they've had. So there is a bank, OCBC Bank, they work with us and um, they're based out of Asia. They're actually making decisions using generative AI today. Yeah. So they're making 4 million decisions a day yeah. and they have a huge, a huge variety of use cases. Uh -huh. So something as simple as text summarization, for example. Yeah. So like an analyst would take normally two hours mm -hmm. to come in the morning and to get the report and read the insight. Yes. Now it takes two minutes and the AI does it for you. Yeah. But they also have things like chat Q&A, which you would expect, mm -hmm. but also they're using Copilot that drives productivity enhancements. Yes. And I do believe that the Copilot use case, when applied properly, mm -hmm can bring significant benefits, of course, to the institution, but it'll help in democratization of AI, yeah. truly. And what I mean by that is, if you look at today, or even six to eight months back, mm -hmm. 
you would need to be a data engineer or a data scientist to be able to retrain a model, change the parameters, change the attributes. But now, even if you're an application developer, mm -hmm. with some training, you can apply enterprise context and you can get different outputs from different use cases. Yeah. So you don't necessarily have to upskill yeah. as an individual. And that's the true power of AI, generative AI specifically, yeah. that it will help democratize data science and machine learning across the masses. And I believe that's a huge opportunity for everyone. To add a couple of points here. So on one side, you know, especially when it comes to Gen AI, yeah, the, the overall economic potential, what we see is in the range of $4.4 trillion. Yeah? So this is incredible high. So and that is supporting what you just said. Yeah? And um, of course, we, we, we look at it, where is generative AI impacting right now or, and, and what is coming in, in the future? So what we see right now is that it is massively impacting for example, processes in marketing and sales, in customer service, but also in software engineering. Yeah. And it has an incredible impact in those areas. On the other side, what we see more and more coming here is our processes or, or areas like product development, for, Nix, for example. Yeah, we, we know from, from some of the, the fashion companies, they are using generative AI now to produce new product designs. Yeah. Yeah? So and that that's an incredible next step of development, yeah. Absolutely. And we see it also being implemented into strategic stra strategic decision making processes. Yes. Yeah. So which is then also moving higher up into the boardroom yes. and make it yeah a co-pilot as you mentioned, but yeah. a very strong co-pilot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we will get to that in a minute with a very interesting story as well. But there's no denying that it's actually reached a C-suite and it's becoming extremely important. And I think the examples that you were mentioning were really just saying what we were before. It's, you know, the augmentation and the, the automization and even the autonomous uh, is coming and reaching the operational levels and is influencing the way businesses are run. I think what I would like to dive a little bit into, because I'm, I'm quite excited by um, having talked to Kai about this, is an experience you ran uh, in your company where you were actually trying to answer the question of, can AI replace the CEO? Absolutely. Um, and coming from an experienced design engineering company, what we usually try to do with new technology is create experiences for people as fast as possible. Yeah. Once you've experienced it, you understand it and it changes everything. So uh, basically my engineering team without asking me started at the beginning of last year creating a crumpy version of me as a digital twin, right? Um, and they actually rolled it out in the company for 200 employees having interaction with that. So and I was like, okay, that's a really crumpy version. It doesn't stand for anything that I think is important and shouldn't definitely take no decision in the company. So I said like, okay, challenge accepted. We can do better than that. So we basically built uh, sort of digital twin configurator around it to empower me to quickly create. And you mentioned that there are so many personas and usually business processes, we design everything around personas. Now we have the possibility to create digital personas other than someone canvases and stuff like that. So I worked throughout the whole year trying to make the real constructive twin a little bit better uh, and closer to that. And going through that process, the outcome and where we are uh, to replacing. It's a whole different story. But you have so many key learnings while doing that. And that's why one learning is I'd advise every CEO not to talk about AI or be informed about it, but really run through the process, creating your own digital twin. Because then it's in your own flesh, you know, what it means about ethical considerations, privacy. Do I want that? Do my voice? Do I want all that stuff? So run through that. And the Two other most important things is it's also in the interaction making you more human because you're basically have someone to work with as a digital twin. The most important thing though is it changes your content and knowledge strategy. Yeah. Because if we're talking about decisions and reasoning, we can inform them with a lot of data and machine learning, mm -hmm. but when, when it comes to reasoning, we also need a reference to how was the decision made in the past? Yeah. Um, Where's the documentation of your strategic decisions? A lot of times as a CEO, you don't want it documented everywhere because it might be wrong. Yeah. So um, what it changed for me is really 
start documenting things you've never written down if you want to empower your future AI assistant or whatever role you want to have. So I started to develop a content strategy uh, to note down strategic decisions, how, uh, how they were made in the past yeah. to feed this somehow so that this persona, because if you can't teach your twin, your people won't understand either. So yes. uh, that's how we went uh, through that. And it's an exciting process um, throughout the year. Basically. Yeah, no, I, I can absolutely imagine. I think what you said maybe is a, is a reason why, you know, the first places in which AI are actually being adopted is where there is data that you can use to train the systems. Whereas the strategic top decisions, I don't know how well they're typically documented and how well they can be used to train an algorithm to make future decisions. So I think that's an interesting proposition. But also maybe I'm, I'm really intrigued to understand, you know, how, how much time it went into a project like that? How much time did it take you? <coughs> um, that ranges from given the current technology. So to build that, you have to like sort of four to five AI models, combine that for visual audio, all that stuff. Yeah. That's quicker than you think. That's uh, stuff like from a workshop to a couple of weeks and the initial version is running. So Grumpy was probably a couple of days. That was actually one engineer a weekend. Crazy and the damage it created. Um, after that, there's a certain amount, probably two to three months to get a proper version, uh, getting through all your data and feeding it with something. And from there on, you've just started that experience and you systematically make it better, interact with it, be the human loop yourself, uh, fine tuning, training, get it to a certain point. Um, and we still are. So after a year, I can still say it's like, um, yeah, a little intern CEO that's running next to me, um, basically. So we're nowhere close to bold decisions or stuff like that. Um, but I think it's important to start that journey now, yeah. right? To be ready um, as the software is evolving and getting better. Yeah. And is Grumpy Kai actually making any decisions? <laughs> um, not really. Not really. Okay. You should, you should well, listen to an employee asking for a raise or a vacation. You don't want to uh, listen no, to Grumpy's the answer, answer is not positive. Okay. Nah, probably not. But it's just, I think the humanoid robots is a real thing, and that is coming faster than what we all like. But I really like the fact, the way example that you shared, because ultimately, if you were to summarize the whole experience of Grumpy Kai versus Normal Kai, and I think it comes down to trust. Yeah. And whether that's AI, whether that's machine learning, everyone wants to be able to trust the models or the insight that is coming out yeah. to be able to make better decisions. Mm -hmm. You want to, you mentioned data. Yeah. Um, everyone wants to be able to trust the data that they're going to use to train their models on. Yeah. And therefore, everyone's talking about that fact that data modes are real. Yeah. Um, so I do believe that whilst AI will be great and there will be a higher amount of trust, there'll be better and higher fidelity outputs that'll come through, yeah. but it'll largely for the purposes of augmentation. Mm -hmm. And that's how it should be because there are multiple emotional variables that will be super hard to program to an extent and you'll have to take a decision <clears throat> for which you'll have to combine the prowess of yeah. the models slash machines along with the humans. And that is prevalent today as well in certain industries, in high tech industries as well. But I think, you know, it, we are just at the beginning, especially when it comes to Gen AI. And I'm, I'm pretty sure in two, three years from now, we see, we will see some emotional elements in those Gen AI models. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm one, more than 100% sure. Yeah, and uh, because if you look into why is that the case, what Kai just mentioned? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, when you take AI as it was before, the standard AI mechanism, it's mainly focused on transactional activities, mm -hmm. yeah, to substitute transactional activities yeah. and processes. Yeah, when it comes to Gen AI, uh, it's the first time that AI becomes creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and that makes a big difference. And that's the reason why something like Kai just described is possible. Mm -hmm. yeah? And of course it raises a big challenge in the, in the back yeah? because it is asking the question, do we really want an AI to run a business or to take such a decision? Yeah? And I give you an example. The answer sounds obvious, yeah? but let's for a moment put yourself into the shoes of a doctor. Yeah, and if you see and if you if you if you um, uh, assume that the doctor you know has a a different performance every day, yeah. 
and you compare this doctor with a robot yeah, taking an operation, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a different thing. Yeah. And they can even take better decisions than a doctor itself. This is even, this is even already the case yeah. when you take radiology. Yeah? Um, so, you know, to, to analyze pictures, yeah, the AI is doing much better mm -hmm. than any human being at the moment. The AI is missing gut feeling though, right? Do we think that that's going to be something exactly. we can replace at some point? And, and having said that, you know, where do you see the limitations of, uh, of this going forward? Yeah, you know, that, that's, and, and that's the question. I, I think there, there are areas where AI can potentially do a better job than a human being. Yeah. But we, from an ethical position, have to take a decision on where do we want AI to, yeah. to be in that role? Yeah. And there are areas where we do not want to be AI in that yeah, role. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I talked to uh, an AI expert uh, the other day who was mentioning that, in fact, they had been working on a trial like that where uh, the doctors um, had, a, I think, an error rate of 4.5% in a certain decision that needed to be made. Uh, AI had 7.5% error rate, but combined. And I think that's the beauty of it. It was at, I think, 0 05 don't hate me if I quoted that wrong, but it was certainly much, much better than each of them could do on their own. And maybe that's where, you know, that's the sweet spot. That's where this is going to go. So we're not even maybe going to go into autonomous completely, not replacing the CEO, but having the CEO have grumpy, Kai and Grumpy Kai basically will make a better combined CEO of a company. So maybe that's where. I think it goes down to governance. That's what we're talking about, like which kind of um, policies, decisions, scope that we want the AI to be involved or not. Um, and we see that today. Like if you look at countries, the European Union came out with directives. In the US, the White House came out with an AI directive yeah. as well. But these are very early days. People haven't necessarily seen the full impact of generative AI in whether that's positive or negative. And yeah. of course, that will evolve over a period of time. But nevertheless, it's an important issue to be discussed. And who's the custodian for the governance mechanisms? And how do you enforce that? Um, we've seen GDPR as a good example for privacy yeah. and when it came out and then in the US, California followed through with CCPA and a lot of other countries, India and everyone else followed through as well. But the enforcement is limited, but that's also because of the fact that um, we're talking about making sure that the person or the end customer or the end consumer having the right to decide how the data is going to be used. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's a little bit more than that because of the self-training nature of generative models then they will already self-train and they will morph into different decision making. So governance is a key piece. Um, and right now, majority of the organizations do that for various use cases. Uh, when you take that to a people decision making capability, it will become a much more granular, complex mechanism and a beast that we'll have to solve for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a mixture of what, what should AI do, what can AI do, right? So we're talking about the ethical aspects, but also maybe the, the technology aspects of what it can do at the moment and where its limits are as well. I don't know if any of you want to comment on that a bit of, of the experiences you've made there. I could talk about... Do you want to go? Yeah, no, let's go. Yeah. And, uh, I will come. So I can talk about one very simple use case. Uh -huh. So I was speaking to... Um, the bank executive who I bank with. And he said, look, when you come to my website, you expect that you say, what's my bank balance? And the bot should be very smart to say in milliseconds, here's what your bank balance is. They should query different systems and should be able to give you an answer. Yeah. Sure. But actually as a banking person, I also expect the bot to be smarter to say, should you have even access to that or not? And that's an authorization question. That's an auditing and governance question, right? And that applies in various forms in different industries as well. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that over a period of time, use cases like the ones I described, or even something as basic that we all have gotten used to, Zoom calls or video calls, whether that's Microsoft or any other tool that we're using, um, there's a recording facility. But there might be a call whereby you want certain parts of the transcript to be viewed only by certain people. Mm -hmm. There are companies who are doing that today. Yeah. They are doing what we call technologically as fine grain access control, yeah. and they allow you to limit the access depending upon the persona. If you extend that to various other use cases mm -hmm. across a multitude of parameters, I do believe that you will try and get to some of the outcomes that you are looking at, and that will be of massive benefit to customers. But um, that's where the metadata governance and everything else comes yeah, into the picture. Yeah. 
But I think you, you were touching also because you were mentioning hardware and uh, infrastructure basically. So you're touching also on another challenge, which is uh, uh, related to computation power and available hardware. Yeah. Yeah? And uh, if you look into this, and we, we, did a cut, we, did a, we did a kind of calculation here, um, at the moment everybody is starting Gen AI models yeah? and is training those models. And this is using in immense computation power. And the computation power needed is, is basically exponential. Yeah, so at a certain point in time, we will, we will come to a limit where the existing computation power will not bring us into the position to reach the next level. Mm -hmm. So that is, of course, asking the question about, okay, do we need to change something in our architecture? Do we need to maybe increase the computation power? Do we need to change or further develop our chipsets in place? All those kind of things. And uh, of course, there are, there are some thoughts out there mm -hmm. uh, which go even beyond what we are discussing here, even in, into the, the area of quantum computing and the likes. But this is something nobody is really looking at at the moment, you know, because everybody is completely, you know, in, in the AI mode, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and only discussing what is possible, but not thinking about what machine do we really need in the background to make it work. To make it work, yeah. And, and, and as you were saying, I mean, one of the, the parts of guidance is how much we can scale that technologically. The other aspect is, again, back to your governance before, is do we need to give people guidance on what it actually makes sense to go and ask ChatGPT, right? <laughs> so how much power is it using for, for useless asks and yeah. questions and things that you don't actually need to do? So there's a sustainability aspect, I think. In yeah, like Nico and I were discussing about this yesterday over dinner, then a lot of organizations are already struggling with making sure they have the right amount of GPUs for the processing of compute. Um, we have a company which is a trillion dollar company, which has grown exponentially over that. Um, and I'm talking about NVIDIA, just to be very clear. But you have other companies like Amazon and others who are bringing in technology to provide that. Um, right now, there's a massive impact on total cost of ownership. For example, we have a retail customer, very large customer, and they told us if they can run scaled AI workloads on GPUs on their existing systems, i.e. data centers and private cloud, they can reduce the total cost of ownership by up to 50%. Yeah. We're talking tens of millions of dollars a month in compute. But I do believe over a period of time, like Nico mentioned, they will run out of the capacities. Like even today, mm -hmm. we're talking about large language models. Yeah. But people are already talking about language action models. Yeah. They're already talking about small language models, right? So as the capabilities to run the parameterized attributes evolve, mm -hmm. the infrastructure, the hardware, the quantum computing capabilities, the normal computing capabilities will also need to evolve. Yeah. Um, and I believe that that will propose they'll pose a new challenge, but also an opportunity for the companies out there. Yeah. Um, it could just very much be like the processes back in the Silicon Valley age. The frequency kept on increasing and after a certain point it became a no-brainer yeah. because the value shifted to software. Yeah. Um, it, there was a quote from Andreessen Horowitz, you know, which said that every company is a software company because you have more lines of code everywhere else. Mm -hmm. I do believe every company will be an AI company in very soon because everyone will have AI use cases to go through with that. Yeah which essentially means you will have to look at your infrastructure, your data assets, the way you have governance mechanisms and policies, etc., mm -hmm. um, all put together and involved. Yeah. So it'll be a combination of things that people will learn. Yeah. Some will be reactive, some will be proactive, and yeah. that's what it is. Absolutely. Kai, did you have any kind of capacity or infrastructure considerations when you were setting up your uh, experiment? Uh, I wanted to add that, and probably we're adding even to the problem the way how we try to do that. Um, with the limitation from last year, it didn't have the scale. So we see that in our enterprise clients, also in the automotive area, um, that they're definitely running into limits as we speak. Yeah. Uh, that's clear. What I like, uh, uh, wanted to add about the limitations, not only on an infrastructure level, but also on the, we thought that guardrails are great and then they're not anymore. Okay. So we're still trying to figure out how to tame Gen AI at all. So there are definitely also in the experience limitations. But what we can also say is, because we had the example with the, with the personas or with the CEO, is that really limiting it to the one twin 
and that's a problem with the with the scalability. You can have thousands. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. I can train or configure a hundred uh, simulating decisions for me. Yeah. The one's an expert in this area behaves like this, and then he suggests a strategic plan how to execute that. And I take the second and the third and the fourth. So what I'm trying to say is, we had the the topic of playfulness uh, uh, the other day. That's also coming into that because we have to accept we're in year one of Gen AI. So a lot will happen. And and that's the, the difficult part is we have to play around on the one hand of the other. On the other hand, all the other forces like limiting it and also making it safe and being able to scale it. I think those things go together. Yeah. And we already see that, but um, as we're not having so many applied Gen AI cases now. I think we're uh, seeing a lot more this year on the enterprise scale, and that will actually uh, uh, be totally uh, the thing that brings to the limit what uh, what uh, these two gentlemen mentioned um, regarding the the power and also the infrastructure and capability um, to make this possible. Yeah, Huge. absolutely. I mean, really exciting discussion, I think, and I think we could continue for a long time. What I'm really interested as well, uh, maybe for our audience, is with, with all of those insights you have and with the learnings that you have under your belt, not just the one year of Gen AI, but AI for a much longer time, um, what can we do already now? What, what can our audience focus on already now? Or, and what should they be focusing on when it comes to AI? I don't know, uh, Nico, if you want to start with that, if you view. Yeah, you know, for, for me, it's pretty clear. And, and, and I always tell this to my kids, yeah. Everybody needs to become an AI specialist mm -hmm. sooner or later. Yeah, and uh, it's about you know democratizing AI for everyone. And we see this sooner or later. We will see toolkits where where we can use AI in a more let's say simple way, easy way to use. But uh, in the end, uh, I think everybody and, and and also we as responsible for companies. Yeah. We need also to spend more attention on education and educating people uh, in that in that space, yeah. Because this is the future, yeah. and the better we educate our people in that space, the better the future will look, will look like. And th this is not just from an from an let's say technical perspective. Mm -hmm. This is also from a corporate responsibility perspective. Yeah. This is from an ethical perspective, yes. from a security perspective, there are so many challenges mm -hmm. associated with AI. Yeah. Yeah? And we need to be able to, first of all, understand what we are doing here. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that it is wrong, and it, it's just the opposite. There's a huge opportunity out there. Yeah. But on the other side, there is a big downside associated with it. Mm -hmm. And if people are not educated, Nobody is able to understand this yeah. and we make people understand this. Yeah, absolutely. As a colleague of mine said just lately, AI is not going to replace people. People who know AI are going to replace people who don't know AI, right? So education uh, on all of the aspects of it, I think, is a, is a very important part. What is your guidance uh, to the audience on what we can start with now? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I second what Nico mentioned. and. Um, it is super important and we see this even today. Like yesterday I was on a panel for LLMs and a lot of people weren't fully familiar with something as basic as retrieval augmented generation. Yeah. But that's okay because that is something that their normal day-to-day -day job doesn't entail. Mm -hmm. But over a period of time, like vernacular like our RAG architectures or fine tuning or XYZ will become much more common. Mm -hmm and that will become embedded in part of the decision-making process. So it's super important for people to upskill themselves and make sure, and it's almost like the internet economy. So when the internet was happening, nobody knew that there will be new economic business models like the gig economy will come through. Nobody knew that there will be new ways of monetizing your product like software as a service and everything will come through. So naturally, there'll be new things that will happen automatically, but you can only focus on the skill. So that's one piece. The other piece for institutions, and we at Clatter have had the fortune of managing a lot of data, right? So we've, um, what a lot of people might not be aware of, that we have 25 million terabytes of data under management. And that's almost like a fourth or fifth of the world's data. And that is enterprise context. But every time we, we work with large enterprises, large banks, large telcos, large insurers, re retailers, they all say that they want to be able to train the models um, on their own enterprise context with their own specific domains. That, mm -hmm. That's what they have. Yeah. Um, but the quality of the outputs mm -hmm. oftentimes depends upon the input and the quality of the data that they have. Yeah. 
So I would say that for the enterprises and the institutions, mm -hmm. it's almost as important to curate the data sets in a manner that you can actually use them in a more effective ways. Right. And it's never too late, and we should all start to prepare the systems accordingly to going through with that. Um, in addition to the personal upskilling level that Nico's already mentioned, yeah, yeah. and that's more for the individuals and the you and I's of the world that we have to evolve to go Absolutely. through. So good data is going to be the fuel, right? Absolutely, yeah. For that engine. Absolutely. And I also totally want to underline the AI literacy part. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a lot of teachers, uh, my kids' teachers, uh, throughout the year, just if, out of cur curiosity whether they were already working with ChatGPT. And most of the time, the only thing you get is someone's really anxious and afraid. Yeah. That's all. It's like you can see the shock in their face. Oh, we haven't, we should, we should look into that. Yeah. Nothing positive about it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's our responsibility as tech ex uh, experts to really create vehicles to take everyone with us on this road. And that's exactly also the part why I say everyone should play around with that digital twin thing. It's not about replacing people. That's, it's just a vehicle to get you into the technology and an obvious uh, thing to do. So we have workshops um, and I'm trying to also bring that into schools, but it's happening in business. So a workshop was with a business people where you usually have strategic workshops and now you have team workshops creating your next team member plus one, just yes. for interacting with the twin and, and getting into the software. It's not that the next has to be a digital next team member, but after that, everyone ran through that and is on a different level on the AI literacy. And I think we need more vehicles as much as possible like that yeah. to take everyone with us so that they know, because once they did it, it's like they totally know, oh, it isn't that bad. It's not that smart as I thought. It's a little bit like, like probability and, and math. Um, and I think if we want to trust this overall thing and make people trust it, it's really a lot, a lot about, I've experienced it, I know a little bit about it, um, and now it's not that bad anymore. I think that's really the core point, so that's uh, really something I underline, AI literacy. Absolutely. Totally. So you're all for hashtag create your digital twin for the learnings of it as well then. <laughs> put it that way. But let me maybe add one additional point to it. So when it comes to AI in company environments, especially, uh -huh. I think it's, it's important also to, to touch a little bit on the security topic, uh, because at the moment companies are implementing AI and generative AI like crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah? And they're doing this, or many companies are doing this without any kind of existing organization structure. You, you mentioned governance, yeah. anything in place. And uh, you shouldn't be aware the hacker is also using Gen AI. They are also using those systems. Yeah, they have those tools. They are maybe they may be or they are maybe already in your system. Yeah, and uh, I think companies need to put attention on this. Yeah, and yes, I see in, in in the discussions I having with with companies very often the situation that you know security topic is a topic, yeah, it's important, but let's discuss different things now, yeah? Uh, maybe later, yeah? yeah? And uh, I think we need to put it a little bit more into the focus. Yeah, absolutely. So the title of the panel should just have been, you know, opportunities for better strategies, but actually the urgency for better strategies that AI puts on us as well then. Perfect. So let me uh, just close this up by summarizing, I think, uh, what we've been going through. So we started out actually looking at, you know, the fact that future and strategy means that AI is a topic and then understanding what that meant from a point of view of the impact on businesses. We talked about decision making and the fact that AI actually influences the way we're making decisions and the processes in a company on all levels, on all roles, uh, basically in every aspect, whether that is augmenting or even running autonomously. And then last but not least, I think the limitations discussions was a really interesting one, uh, looking at the technological limitations, looking at ethical you know, limitations, looking at the way we, we, we could, but also we should use this in the future. So I hope that uh, the audience finds this uh, inspiring or as inspiring as I was finding it, you know, and the learnings and insights that I gained from that. And all that remains for me to do is to really thank you uh, for being here with me uh, on that panel and sharing your experience, sharing your knowledge. I think that was immensely insightful. And I hope that was the same for the audience out there as well. Thank you for hosting. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.